UFC 300 is upon us. And I'm going to go through the entire card, starting with the early prelims, ending with the main event, giving my prediction and breakdown for every single fight on the card. But before I get into my predictions, I need to tell you guys something first and come clean. This year has been my worst year for predictions out of all of the five years that I've been doing this on YouTube. And this has also been the year where I have sank so many more hours into research for my predictions. It's become very clear to me that logic has no place in this sport. So I need to turn to drastic measures. I need to take it back in time to a better time where I had good predictions. So if you'll give me one moment before I get into the early prelim opener, I need to do something to ensure an 100% clean sweep on this historical card. Bear with me. I'm turning to drastic measures. Cody Garbrandt versus Davis and Figueredo. We make our prediction now. Davis and Figueredo is going to win this fight. Yeah! <laughs> Cody Garbrandt by KO. I just saw a vision in my head. Cody Garbrandt is going to lay Davis and Figueredo out cold in the first round. Figueredo's charging forward. He's throwing straight punches and Cody Garbrandt beats him to it on the inside with a devastating right hook straight on the chin. Down goes Figueredo, face first into the canvas at the end of round one. And now I'm going to tell you guys why. Davison Figueredo is a straight line puncher. He throws ones, he throws twos. Cody Garbrandt does not play the lineal game of mixed martial arts. He's a hooker. In the nicest way possible I could ever say that. Okay? He's going to throw hooks. He's going to keep his head off the center line. He's going to make Figueredo come to him. Figueredo against Rob Font in his last fight looked good. It was a competitive fight, but he landed the more damaging shots. He made Rob Font come to him and he timed him. He timed him coming in. He made Rob Font reach. He made Rob Font go first. And he caught Rob Font with his lead hand, piston jab, right on the chin. Wobbled him now and again. I think Cody Garbrandt is going to make this fight a single digit significant strike per round type contest. He's going to be on the outside. He's going to be dancing for no reason out of range of Davis and Figueredo. He is going to make Davis and Figueredo go first. And when Davis and Figueredo goes first, he's very, very hittable on the chin. And that's where Cody Garbrandt's going to be waiting to make his attack. And that's where Cody Garbrandt will time a beautiful shot on Davis and Figueredo, putting him down. I've watched the two of them side by side. I've seen it. Cody Garbrandt is the faster man. Cody Garbrandt might be. The fastest man in the UFC. And I think he's got a perfect style to defeat Davis and Figueredo. He's got momentum. After so long of us wondering, is Cody Garbrandt going to be the same after that loss? We now know that he's got momentum. He's back on track. His confidence is going to be high. He's not going to be desperate for a win. He's going to be patient. He's going to be calm. He's going to slow the fight down like he did against Kelleher, like he did against Trevin Jones. And he's going to make Figueredo go first and punish him. And punish him. 
People are saying Davison Figueredo is going to easily KO Cody Garbrandt. Davison Figueredo's last KO was against Joseph Benavidez. I ain't trying to hear it! Cody Garbrandt lays him out at the end of round one. We move on to another fight up the card, which is Bobby Green versus Jim Miller. And you know what, guys? I'm actually going to go with Bobby Green. I feel like Bobby Green's going to win this fight. I think he's got all of the opportunity to... Yeah! Uh, uh, Jim Miller! Jim Miller's going to win. I just saw it in my head. I just saw it in my head once again. Jim Miller is going to put out Bobby Green in round two. This is going to be a devastating win from Jim Miller. I just saw the vision. I'm getting these performances telecasted to my brain once again. Jim Miller is going to destroy the lead leg of Bobby Green. He's going to hack it to pieces. Jim Miller's been on fire recently. He's going to destroy the lead leg of Bobby Green. And let me tell you something right now. If you think Bobby Green is ever going to be the same again, after his recent loss to Jalen Turner, you've got another thing coming. It's not happening. Who's going to be the guy that's shooting a takedown here? It's going to be Jim Miller. Who's going to be the guy that's chopping low with kicks? It's going to be Jim Miller. Who's going to be the guy that's throwing baby one-twos? It's Bobby Green, man. I don't care if you beat Ally Quinta after he just sold a house to a middle-aged couple in Maine. I don't care. I think Jim Miller is going to chew up the legs of Bobby Green. I've got hair in my face. I can barely see right now. But I can see the result of this fight very clearly. Jim Miller chews up the leg of Bobby Green. They get scrappy. And Jim Miller is going to find the chin of Bobby Green in round two. After chewing up his leg. After having Bobby Green a little bit gun shy. I really don't believe that Bobby Green has any chance of being the same fighter he once was after being destroyed by Jalen Turner and then watching the referee in that fight allow Bobby Green to have his chin absolutely Thanos snapped out of his career because he was allowed to take 15 unanswered blows on the canvas whilst he was completely out cold. And let me add one more thing. That fight was in December. Four months ago, Jim Miller's on a roll. He's got momentum. He's going to get this one done over Bobby Green. He's going to chew up the legs. He's going to find the chin in the second round. And Bobby Green's going to go down. And it's going to be a downfall of his career. I'm going with Jim Miller. I'm going with Jim Miller by TKO. I think he's got the recipe to win. And if anyone's going to shoot a takedown, it's going to be him. We move on to another fight up the card. Jessica Andrade. Versus Marina Rodriguez. You know what, guys? I'm going with Jessica Andrade. <laughs> I'm going with Marina Rodriguez. What am I talking about, Jessica Andrade? You're right, Beanie. You're right, Beanie. I'm going with Marina Rodriguez here. Look at the Yan Zhao Nan performances. Look at the differences in how they handled that. Jessica Andrade, little bro. And I mean little bro. I'm still unsure. Your four left hooks in a row ain't going to work anymore. It's a different strawweight division. And you're coming back down after, by the way, making me think Erin Blanchfield was a capable female fighter. You did that. You made me believe that Erin Blanchfield had some level of boxing. You made me believe that Erin Blanchfield had some level of grappling. She has neither. Neither of those things. She's disgraceful in every area of combat sports. And you're the reason as to why I thought she wasn't. That's enough of a reason for me to pick Marina Rodriguez to win this fight against Jessica Andrade and be patient and be on the outside and outpoint this dude. I'm going with Marina Rodriguez. I'm going with Marina Rodriguez. By split decision. I think Andrade is going to get messy. I think Marina Rodriguez is going to have a ton of success in this fight. Where? In the clinch. On the outside, I think she's a bit better. 
On the inside, I think Andrade is a bit better, but I think there's a chance for Marina Rodriguez to find the tie clinch on the inside. And that's where she's going to blast knees to the body, to the head, elbows in the clinch as well. And I think Andrade is going to walk into those. So you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say Marina Rodriguez by TKO because there is no way in hell I'm picking a girl to win a fight that just made me believe that Erin Blanchfield has ever thrown a punch before in her life. Because she clearly hasn't, as we saw against Manon Fiora. She's clearly never done a boxing lesson in her life. And Andrade made me believe she was the future of MMA. So how about this, Andrade? You're getting smoked. This ain't Mackenzie Dern, who has also never thrown a punch in her life. This is Marina Rodriguez, and she's going to win this fight in the clinch, in the pocket, and she's going to knee you in the face as you rush in. How about that? We move on. Up the card to another fight. Jalen Turner versus Hinato Moicano. Now, Moicano, I have a ton of respect for you, buddy. I really do. Ton of respect, but I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go with Jalen Turner. I'm going with Hanato. I need to stop making a noise every time, but I'm going to make a noise every time. Hanato Moicano is going to win. Easy. Easy. Rene could choke round one. Rene could choke round one. Put your money down. Put your money down. This Rene could choke round one. We're going to have an epic card of epic finishes. Wild results. Renato Moicano will get down Jalen Turner and will take his back. You want to know why? Mateus Gamrock controlled Jalen Turner on the ground. I don't care if he wasn't prepared. You should be throughout your decade of training. Gamrock got him down, kept him down in moments early in that fight. You know what the difference is between Mateus Gamrock and uh, Renato Moicano? Renato Moicano has submission ability. We've seen people take down Jalen Turner and quite frankly... Jalen Turner, when your opponent has a takedown as an option, you ain't the same looking fighter as you are when they don't. Dan Hooker took it to you with one arm after the second round. Why? He's a tall dude. He's a rangy dude. He's not some little five foot eight dwarf that you can bully at lightweight. Do I think Dan Hooker's got the crispest strike him? Do I think Dan Hooker's faster than Jalen Turner? No, I don't. Yet he was still able to pull it off with one arm. He was able to get top position over Jalen Turner with one arm and keep him there in moments of that fight. I think that Jalen Turner is going to be off to a good start. I think Moicano is going to try and strike with him. I really do. I think Jalen Turner is going to land some good shots. I really do. But I think Canato Moicano before long is going to find the hips of Jalen Turner and when he finds those hips, he doesn't have to find the takedown from them. He has to find the back control. And I think from there, Jalen Turner is a body type that is scalable for Renato Moicano. He's going to climb Jalen Turner all the way to his back and sink in a choke in round one. Moicano's back. He's got momentum. He's not coming off an injury. He's not coming off a year off. Dober's a short, stocky dude. For a guy like Moicano, that's a dangerous man to try and find the hips of. Jalen Turner, the hips are there for Moicano. He don't have to shoot that low. He's going to shoot straight in on those hips. Turner's going to buck him off. And then, Hanato Moicano's going to keep control of the hips, go round to the back, drag down Jalen Turner and start looking to put hooks in. Jalen Turner's 14 and 7, by the way. Just want to mention that. Moicano's been around the game too long to go in there with a dumb game plan of striking with Jalen Turner. I think he's going to look to find the hips and where Gamrock could take him down and where Frivola could take him down over and over again. I think Canato Moicano's going to also be able to and I think he's going to lead him to get a rear naked choke in this fight. We move on to another fight up the card on the prelims. Sadiq Youssef versus Diego Lopez. I'm actually going with Sadiq Youssef here. Honestly, I think this is the end of the road for Diego Lopez. Yeah, to the pen. I'm going with Diego Lopez. Oof. 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 Rene could choke. I'm going with Diego Lopez, man. I watched Sadiq Youssef's fights. I thought to myself, 
He's going to be able to find the chin of Diego Lopez. I really did. I just put out a tweet saying it. I just put out a tweet saying that Sadiq Yusuf has actually got a really underrated chance of beating Diego Lopez here. You know what I did after that? I typed in a couple words into my Fight Pass search engine. You want to know what those words were? Those words were Sadiq Youssef versus. And then you know what I did after that? I moved my little mouse over to a fight that Fight Pass had called Sadiq Youssef versus Alex Caceres. I don't rate Alex Caceres at all. In any way. And Sadiq Yusuf struggled beyond belief. Especially in round one. This is going to be a fight card where every single fighter on the card is feeling round one pressure. Every single one of them are. They're going to feel round one pressure. And Diego Lopez is going to thrive under that pressure more than Sadiq Yusuf. Well, you want to know why? Diego Lopez hasn't been told wrong about his style yet. It's worked for him. He's gone out there. He's been wild and he's pulled it off against Gavin Tucker, against Pat Sabatini, and even against Movzar Evloev in round one as well. This is a man who on short notice stepped up and gave Movzar Evloev all he could handle and arguably could have won that fight as well. Extremely, extremely close. And if it was on full camp, You'd have to argue that Lopez arguably would have won if he had full preparation. He's a big, rangy dude. Yusuf don't really like that. We saw that against Caceres. You know what else we saw against Caceres? In the scrambles, where both of them were landing shots on each other, Alex Caceres was able to get to the back of Sadiq Yusuf in round one. And I think if Alex Caceres can get there, Diego Lopez can get there and then some. That's where he finishes the fight against Sadiq Youssef. His submission ability is insane. And quite frankly, as much as I rate Sadiq Youssef quite highly, because, I mean, I remember watching that Mike Davis fight on the Contender Series like everyone else. I thought this guy was the future of the sport. I can't help but notice a quality difference in this man's wins by KO compared to this man's competitive decisions. Gabriel Benitez. <laughs> I don't care, okay? We go to 2020, Andre Philly by competitive decision. I don't like that, man. I really don't like that. Andre Philly, you couldn't put him away? I think Lopez puts Philly away with ease. Lost to Arnold Allen, all good. Beats Don Shaness by finish. Who else does he finish by finish? No one but those two. Don Shaness and who? Gabriel Benitez? And who? Suman Mokhtarian? They ain't Diego Lopez, little bro. He's going to be in a scrap with you. And if these two get scrappy, I'm trusting in Diego Lopez's finishing ability over a higher class of opponent than Sadiq Yusuf's. I'm going Diego Lopez. We move on. Also, Sadiq Yusuf just went in a five-round war with Edson Barboza. When you go to a five-round war, there's a mindset in your brain of let me keep this next one composed. Let's not make this next one messy. And when Diego Lopez forces you into that messy, uncomposed fight, I think he's going to be more comfortable there than Yusuf is. I'm going with Diego Lopez. We move on to another fight up the card, which is going to be Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison. I'm going to go with Holly Holm. <laughs> Oh my god, I just sent I just got sent through the fight. And it nearly put me to sleep. God, it was boring. And who won? It was Kayla Harrison. I can see her man face already. Shriveled and ugly. And wrinkly and masculine. I can see it. Wait, is that Holly Holm? No, it's not. It is Big Nose. It's Kayla Harrison. It's Kayla Damn Harrison. She makes the weight. And Holly Holm, in the middle of the fight, whilst doing okay up against a clinch, all of a sudden, the number comes down from above, and it gets placed above her head. And you know what that number is? It's the number 42. And then words come around, and it says, years of age. 42 years of age. 
She ain't out wrestling Kayla Harrison. She's going to get taken down. She already said she's pulling out if Kayla Harrison doesn't make weight. So I don't need to worry about a, a situation where if Kayla Harrison misses weight, what do I do then? If Kayla Harrison makes weight and stays disciplined, she goes for takedowns that I've never seen women go for in MMA before. Especially in those higher weight classes. In women's MMA, the takedowns are dumb, unprofessional, trash looking, soy. Kayla Harrison yoinks a single leg, trips out the rear leg, drags a bitch around on a single leg and dunks her over. That's the kind of takedowns I'm looking for here. And I think Holly Holm's going to be in for a world of trouble. Now, I don't like the stand-up of Kayla Harrison, but what I do like here is her physicality, is her strength, is her passion and focus. What's Holly Holm fighting for at 42? What's the point anymore? Kayla Harrison has got a second leaf of her career awaiting her with a successful victory here and also a potential title fight as well. And I think she's going to go out there and get it. I think she's going to stick to the game plan, go out there, look good at 135, find the takedown on Holly Holm, and Holly Holm is going to be looking real 42 years of age when she's on bottom in half guard and Kayla Harrison's laying on top of her. And before you tell me, what if the referee stands it up? What if there's a lack of action and they end up back on their feet? That shit don't happen in women's MMA. The separation rule is for men only in the UFC. And you know that's true. I'm going with Kayla Harrison to get down Holly Holm and dominate her in this fight to a decision win 30-27. Kayla Harrison wins this fight. We move on to another fight up the card. Calvin Cater. Versus Aljamain Sterling. You know what? I'm going to go with Calvin Cater finding his chin. Aljamain Sterling's just way too open coming in. Um, the way he like, goes in with his shots and leans his head off to the side. I can so see Calvin Cater bouncing back and timing him with a right hand as he comes in here. I'm going with Aljamain Sterling. The Funk Master's going to get it done. He's going to show these featherweights what real grappling is. Because guess what? There ain't been a successful featherweight grappler since Movzar Evloev, and he's one of the soyest grapplers I've ever seen in my life. Okay? What grappler has there been that Calvin Cater's gone have to worry about? Also, I want to mention with Calvin Cater, 36 years of age, coming off of a very long layoff. The last time this guy fought was in October of 2022. He's been out of the cage for a year and a half now. That's not a good amount of time to be off, especially when that year and a half is taking you from 34 and a half years of age to 36. Aljamain Sterling's getting back in there. An appropriate time off after losing to Sean O'Malley. He's bulked himself up to 145. He's going to have a new sense of life in his career, not worried about that weight cut anymore. All he's going to focus on is game plan on fight week. He's going to be strong and he's going to show these featherweights what a real entry of a double leg looks like. And I also want to tell you this. Where did Calvin Cater get injured? Very important to note. Normally when we see a leg injury in MMA, it happens to the lead leg of the opponent. If the lead leg of the opponent is damaged or if the lead leg of Calvin Cater is damaged, I don't mind. Aljo's going to have a hold of it. Do I care if it's injured? No, he's going to be balancing on the rear one. But wait. The injury he received against Arnold Allen. When his leg shattered in two places in the ligaments of his leg. And he had to get multiple surgeries to heal it up. Was on his rear leg. If Aljamain Sterling can find his way into a single leg. That rear leg ain't keeping Calvin Cater upright. Ain't keeping him afloat. And Aljamain Sterling's going to be able to find the takedown, then find the back of Calvin Cater, who is not going to be switched on enough early, and he's not going to be ready for the scramble. Early on, Sterling's got to go single legs. He can go double legs, but I think a single leg is a good option for him here. If he goes for those takedowns, he will be successful. And guess what as well? He don't have to box. If he chops low kicks at range, he will also have success here. I don't like the time off for Calvin Cater. I don't like the injuries of Calvin Cater. I think Aljamain Sterling at 145 is going to have a new passion for the sport. He's going to have a new love for the game. And he's going to come out looking the best he's looked. 
and I think he will finish Calvin Cater or ride this one out to a decision win, working those takedowns. I'm going with Aljamain Sterling to get this one done. He had an off night against Sean O'Malley. He was rushed back into a fight. When you don't rush Aljamain Sterling and you let him pick his time of return according to his own wants and needs, he's going to be the best he's ever looked and he's going to find this win over Calvin Cater. We move on to another fight up the card. Yuri Prohaska versus Alexander Rakic. I'm going with Yuri Prohaska. Rakic. It's Rakic. Let me look into my beanie real quick and tell you how. Uh, no, Yuri, no. No, check the leg kicks, Yuri, please. Yeah, let me out of this VR of the fight where Yuri's losing. I'm going with Alexander Rakic. Yuri Praska's had the same weakness his entire career, and it's low kicks. It's low kicks. Never deals with them. Sits into them too much. Alexander Rakic has got a great way of winning this fight. He does perfect off the back foot. If you're telling me, Yuri Praska, he puts these guys under pressure, man. He puts them where they're not used to being. No one's used to backpedaling that much. All this pussy does is backpedal. No offense, Alexander Rakic. All you do is backpedal, bro. You're going to be right at home against Yuri Praska. Rakic, if anything, has been training to backpedal since the day he laced up gloves. That's all he does. So I'm going to go with Alexander Rakic. He's looking crispy on the pads. And Yuri Praska, quite frankly, is returning too soon after being smoked by Alex Pereira. He got smoked in November. He didn't take too much damage. He's back already, though. I don't like that he's coming off a KO loss. I reckon Alexander Rakic is going to chew up that lead leg of Yuri Praska, which is there for the taking against anyone who has any somewhat decent level of low kicks. And I think Alexander Rakic, eventually, after chewing up that leg of Yuri Praska, is going to work some takedowns, like we saw Glover Teixeira do. And Yuri Praska, although he has good scrambles, with that leg destroyed, he's going to use that strength to explosively spring himself out of these positions to find his way back up to his feet. I think Rakic has the ability to shoot a takedown here. I like that. I think Rakic has the ability to destroy that lead leg. I like that. I also think Rakic has the ability to time a counter as Yuri comes in. If he doesn't fall for the antics, if he doesn't fall for the goofy R striking, Rakic is going to find his way to win this fight by finish. <laughs> Or by decision. Either way, I'm going with Alexander Rakic by method of destruction of Yuri's legs. We move on to the main card. Bo Nickel versus Cody Brandage. I'm going with Bo Nickel. I'm going with Bo Nickel. I am. I really am. Can you guys hear that ticking? Sorry, I've just gone a bit lightheaded. Uh... Anyway, Bo Nickel's going to outclass this dude. Cody Brundage don't belong in the same cage as Bo Nickel. He really doesn't, and the UFC knows that, which is why they've put him up as a sacrificial lamb live on pay-per-view. Whoa, I'm going a bit lightheaded here. I don't know why I'm going so lightheaded during this prediction video, but I am going with Bo Nickel. Whoa, hang on a second, guys. Dang it! Dang it! Dang it! Cody Brundage... <laughs> Oh! Unbelievable! Cody Brundage knocks him out! Flatline KO! I'm going with Cody Brundage. I'm joking. I'm not going with Cody Brundage. I was going to do that silly little joke for every prediction, but no, I'm actually going with Bo Nickel. Uh, Cody Brundage is a fat dum dum. Big fat dum dum. Ooh, fatty dum dum boy. Come on, fat, 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 fat dum dum boy. You dum dum. Go join the military, dum dum. Why are you being an MMA fighter, dum dum? Fucking big fat dummy. Big fat dummy. Fucking Shane Gillis faced dum dum. Fix your face, dum dum. Big fat dummy. Ooh, you big dum dum. You fucking big dumb fuck. Cody Brandage is gonna lose. You wanna know why? <laughs> Fluke to win over Zachary Reese. Slammed him on his head. Sawyer win. Oh well, he won it because he slammed him on his head. Good job, dude. Before that, what was his other win that he got? Jacob Malkoon. Why? Malkoon was beating him up wrong. That's why. And back of the headshots are only counted as illegal if the UFC don't like the person who's doing it to someone. 
Jacob Malkoon loses the fight because he's hitting Cody Brundage in the back of the fucking head. Bullshit wins. He's not on a win streak. As far as I'm concerned, he's a loser. You're looking at a man who got out grappled by Cedric Dumas. Boonk gang himself. Whole lot of gang shit. Out wrestled this man to a decision win. Boonk gang out wrestled him. Tard looking blue face out wrestled Cody Brundage. Bo Nickel gone. Ragdoll this fat boy. And he's going to find the finish. I reckon by rear naked choke on Cody Brundage or by TKO. This ain't Jamie Pickett. No, I'm joking. This is Cody Brundage, and he's awful. And he did KO Trayshawn Gore, to be fair to him. But Trayshawn Gore... Trayshawn Gore's vision is 70% obstructed by his nose. His eyes are that close together. So I'm going to go with Bo Nickel. He's way better on the feet from what we've seen. He's way better on the ground from what we've seen. And I'm just going to tell you one thing about Bo Nickel right now. You put Cody Brundage against Val Woodburn... He might fucking lose. I'm going with Bo Nickel. Getting this one done. I like that he took time off. I really like that he took time off. I really, really enjoy that. I'm going to go to his topology to find out how much time he took off. He's been out for nearly a year. He's been out for like nine and a half months. He fought in July of last year against Val Woodburn. And he took the rest of the time off to train, get better, improve, so I guarantee he's going to be healthy for this one. I think he's going to rise to the occasion. And I'm telling you right now, one thing Bo Nickel has as an advantage over everyone else, I'm going to move on from this because it doesn't need much breaking down. We know this is a sacrificial lamb fight. One thing Bo Nickel has over everyone else, dude's been put in high pressure situations as a wrestler. That's not something wrestlers are used to. This guy was competing at a very high level where people were there to see him lose. People were there to see him win since a very young age. I can trust him to handle the moment of a main card opener of UFC 300 more than I can Cody Brundage. I see Brundage pissing himself, folding, and Bo Nickel leaving with a first round finish in any way that he wants. We move on. Up the card. Charles Oliveira versus Armand Sarukian. You know what, Armand Sarukian might get this one done. He really might do. Armand Sarukian might get this one done. He's the new age of fighter. He held up better in the grappling against Islam Makashev than Oliveira did by far. And that was a way worse version of Armand Sarukian. This is a man who KO'd Benil Dariush. Oh, wait, Oliveira did that as well. Oh! Left hook KO from Charles Oliveira. When did he saw it? Bitch, baby, bitch. Bitch boy lightweight's gonna realize you ain't ready for the top five. Not one of you's ready for the top five. Not one of you's ready for the top five. At all. Not one of you. Every single one of you ain't ready. Because you know why? You've all been previously fraud checked without us even fucking realizing it yet. Benoit Saint Denis moves on against Poirier. Oh, well, he was getting chinned against uh, Thiago Moises nearly up against a cage. Oh, uh, Poirier ain't going to be able to do that. He's going to get taken down. What does Poirier do? Chin him up against a cage. Rafael Fiziev goes in there against Gaethje. Fiziev is going to destroy him, dude. Light work for Fiziev. Uh, he struggled with Bobby Green. Boom, Gaethje beats him. Very close fight, though, to be fair. Very, very close fight. Arguably, Fiziev could have won. I stand by that. Armand Sarukian. If you think you're going to make Charles Oliveira look easier than you did Joaquin Silva when you got wobbled and didn't know where you were for about 30 seconds after he caught you with a left hook in the pocket in an exchange, you got another thing coming. You got another thing coming. So I'm going to go with Charles Oliveira guillotining the fuck out of you badly after rocking you with a left hook. Wobbling you. It's going to be a close fight. Armand Sarukian's going to have some moments. He may get a takedown early that Charles Oliveira gets back up from. But guess what, Armand Sarukian? You made me think Gamrock could strike. (laughs) 
You made me think Gamrot was masculine. I don't care if you arguably should have won that fight. I don't care how good the grappling exchanges were. You couldn't drop that fall with anything other than a spinning back fist? RDA dropped him. RDA fucking dropped that fall. You made me think Gamrot could strike? <laughs> There's no shame in losing to Makashev. He's the GOAT. I don't know what I'm pointing at. Makashev is not in my room to the corner. Okay? Neither is a GOAT. I don't know why I pointed over there to say that. Oliveira is going to find the left hook, the same one that Joaquin Silva found to wobble Armand Sarukian. And he's going to guillotine him after Armand shoots in for a panicked takedown. Round one, guillotine. Charles Oliveira, guess what? Shh, 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 shh. Shh, 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 shh. do work in high-level MMA. We're going to find that out this weekend. We move on to another fight up the card. Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. Oh, my pa, 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 ha, pa, nina. Ma, wake, 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 mina. Oh, how are you? Keep balsa. Max Holloway's going to win the fight. And I'm not switching this time. Yeah. No, I'm joking. I'm not. <sighs> Max Holloway is going to lose this fight. You know who's going to win? Hey, man. Jerome Holloway. I've seen the buzz cut fade. That ain't Max. That's Jerome, baby. That's Jerome coming in. Hey, man. Hey, Coachy, man. You got a problem, man. Hey, Jerome's coming to play. This ain't Max. This ain't Maximilian. This ain't Maximus. This ain't anything else that Max could be short for. <sighs> Why am I still looking at the camera? Jerome is coming to play. Fade, buzz cut, bulked, hitting the gym, less of a weight cut. Max Holloway might come through with a deeper voice. I am the heat, man. I am the heat. Jerome's coming out to play. And he's going to beat on Justin Gaethje badly, dude. Badly, he's going to beat him up. He's going to style on him. He's going to style on him. This is going to be the best Holloway we've ever seen. Fully prepared for his lightweight debut. Justin Gaethje. Let me just break some shit down to you. Who's Justin Gaethje KO'd? Oh, yeah, he KO'd Poirier. Yeah. Who's he KO'd with a punch? He ain't head kicking another guy in a row. That just We're not getting two Gaethje head kick KOs in a row. Not, off, not happening. Off the table. If he finishes Holloway, it's going to have to be by punch. Someone remind me who Gaethje's KO'd by punches. This threatening power that all of a sudden Holloway's not going to be able to stand up against. Please, I fucking beg of you. Tell me who Gaethje has KO'd. I'm not seeing any great names. I'm looking back. I thought Michael Chandler was chinny. I thought Michael Chandler was a chinny fighter. That's what the internet would have you believe. Gaethje couldn't finish him. Chandler was walking headfirst into Gaethje with his hands down by his waist, like an idiot, like a big dumb dumb that he is, walking forward when he could have just stayed composed and arguably won, walking into Gaethje's power, full force. And he didn't get put down in the third. He got put down in the second, no. Perfect uppercut. You ain't landing an uppercut on Holloway. You're gonna have to land a hook. You ain't landing an uppercut on a guy that tall, on a guy that stands that tall either. That's not going to be an option of... That's not going to be a weapon of choice. <clears throat> He's going to have to land a hook on Holloway. And I'll be honest with you guys. Pimlet dropped Ferguson, man. I know you can say Gaethje ruined his chin. Lando Venata dropped Ferguson, man. Anthony Pettis dropped Ferguson twice, man. Gaethje couldn't do it. Everything he had. Not everything he had, but clean. Big shots. Couldn't find the chin of Tony Ferguson. And guess what? As much as it hurts my heart to accept this, Tony Ferguson can't fucking fight to save his life. He's just weirdly autistic and it works for him in MMA. And he's tough. Okay? Other than that, who has Gaethje KO'd? With punches. You tell me. Donald Cerrone? 
So I guess Alex Morono's got knockout power now. Is that what we're saying? Or are we not saying that? I guess we're not saying that. Okay. He KO'd James Vick with a punch. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's what we decide, meaning if KOing James Vick means you've got knockout power, my nan's got knockout power. But all I'm going to say, a gust of wind has knockout power. If KO in James Vick has knockout power. An open window on a breezy summer's day has knockout power. If KO in James Vick means you have fucking knockout power. I don't think his power in his hands is as much as people want to, as much as people think it is. I think Holloway's going to stand up to those shots. And I think after he eats a couple of those shots, he's going to dig in on Gaethje. Stay in the pocket, stay in the sequence, and start landing multiple shots. Gaethje will swing, miss, land the second. Holloway will go back at him, jab up high, jab down low, body, head, boom, 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 boom. Gaethje swings back on him against the cage. Holloway eats it, body, body, boom, 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 boom. Holloway has the perfect style to capitalize on the two-punch sequencing of Justin Gaethje. That's my real lo logical thought on this. He has the perfect style to fix the two-punch sequencing of Justin Gaethje. And guess what else he has? Rangy kicks. We saw that against Arnold Allen. We saw that against Calvin Cater. We even saw it against Volkanovski in moments as well. I'm not going to judge him for his third loss against Volkanovski. Volkanovski was on a different level that night. And he's shorter. And Holloway is not built to beat shorter opponents. We saw it against Frankie Edgar. He looked terrible against Frankie Edgar. Awful. I reckon a taller opponent like Gaethje is going to go into his two-punch situation where he throws a right hand step through left hook or a left hook step through right hand that he always does. And Holloway's going to find him after that. He's going to continue the exchange on his own terms and find the chin of Justin Gaethje. I'm going with it. I'm going to go with Max Holloway. Third round TKO. People wobble Gaethje. They wobble him. They really do. You know what they do after they wobble him? They swing the most powerful shots you've ever seen in your life. And Gaethje, in his ebb and flow state, is able to rock and ride with those shots and move out the way of a hook coming this way and a, a hook coming that way and rotate with them and shoot an uppercut left hook back. Holloway is not going to do that. If he lands a shot that gets the respect of Gaethje, and happens to wobble Gaethje. There's going to be a jab, jab, two coming his way. There's going to be a jab, jab, move out the way. Two, two, body, body, head, head, jab. I'm going with Max Holloway. I think he's got the volume, pressure style that's going to work if he manages to crack Justin Gaethje. I think he's the best he's ever looked. I think he's fully prepared for his lightweight debut. And he's going to wipe the floor with this ginger. I don't like to root against gingers because they are superhuman. But... I'm going against Gaethje here, man. Low kicks, not a part of Gaethje's game as much as they once were. Not a punch, not a part of his game as much as they once were. Since he was, when he's in the pocket, his low kicks are dangerous. They are. But since he's been a bit more at range, his low kicks have taken a bit of a backseat in his game. They have. They're not as much of a factor anymore. I'm going with Max Holloway. Don't be surprised if you see him shoot a takedown here and make Justin Gaethje wrestle where he self-admittedly said he hates to because it gasses him out. I'm going with Max Holloway. If he wrestles, he'll negate the low kicks. He can also move a lot better on the back foot. Look at the movement of any fighter that's fought Gaethje and then watch Holloway in his last few performances. Rafael Fiziev. No in and out movement. You ain't Mike Tyson, little bro. You have no power in your hands. I don't know how. You look like you're swinging for the fences and it should kill people. But you don't have any power for some reason. You're like the Paulo Costa of lightweight. I don't know what's going on with your hands. They're made of soy. They're purely made of soy. Look at the other opponents, the opponents that Gagey's fought. Poirier. He's not scooting around on the outside. Max Holloway is going to be scooting around on the outside. And it's going to be a stark difference compared to anyone else Gaethje has fought. And before you mention you forgot Gaethje KO'd Edson Barboza, he KO'd him after eye poking the shit out of him. I ain't trying to call that a legit KO, dude. We move on to another fight 
up the card, Zhang Weili versus Yan Zhaonan. I'm going with Yan Zhaonan in the upset. Oh, I'm going with Zhang Weili. That noise was just another noise to switch my mind. It has no relevance to this fight. I'm going with Zhang Weili. She's on HGH. She's a lab experiment. Never seen a female with muscle insertions like her. <sighs> Yan Zhaonan's going to lose. Um, she's all right, though. Maybe it'll be a fun decision. Uh, but Zhang Weili is just uh, actually good. And uh, Yan Zhaonan is good enough to beat Andrade's bitch ass. But um, I'm going to go Zhang Weili by decision. I'm going to say 49-46, maybe a 48-47 scorecard, maybe a 50-45 scorecard. It's going to be one of those fights where there's a few close rounds and a few clear rounds in favor of Zhang Weili. I don't see Yan Zhaonan finishing her. I don't trust that. And I in no way see Yan Zhaonan being able to win this fight by decision either. I'm going with Zhang Weili. I don't think I need to explain myself. She's way better than Yan Zhaonan. Simple as that. And she seems to be improving every fight. Her performance against Amanda Lemos was one of the most impressive performances in women's MMA history. I stand by that. She absolutely dominated a very dangerous challenger. I'm going with Zhang Weili getting this one done. Decision win. Domination. Using her grappling as something that she's implemented into her game. We move on. Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill. I'm going Jamal Hill. Can you guys hear music? Alex Pereira wins. Alex Pereira's gone win. There was an idea that was Jamal Hill. I still want to interview him on Fight Week, but I think I've just sealed the deal that I'm not going to do it. But you know what I didn't want to do with Jamal Hill? I kind of felt myself picking Alex Pereira again. Reach out to me, Jamal Hill. Let me know if I can still do an interview with you. What I didn't want to do with Jamal Hill is have him on the show, be all buddy-buddy with him, and then just say, yeah, Alex Pereira is going to win a couple of days later. I didn't want to be fake like that. Have him on last week, butter him up. Yeah, let's team up against Ariel. <laughs> How's that Ariel guy? What a snake, right? And all of a sudden, after the fucking interview's over, I do a fucking video saying... Yeah, Pereira's knocking this dude out. I didn't want to be that guy. So I wanted my opinions on this fight to be final and known before I had Jamal Hill on the show. So if he wants to be on during fight week, Jamal Hill, let me know. I hope you respect the mindset I had about that. I really do. Because I wanted to have you on. I just didn't want to be fake and all buddy-buddy. And then all of a sudden, I'm picking Alex Pereira by KO. He's going to KO this guy. I wanted my statement and my prediction to be known. So Jamal Hill knows exactly what kind of territory he's coming to when he does an interview with me. You know what I'm saying? If he does an interview. I'm going Alex Pereira. And I'm going to tell you why. There's an idea of Jamal Hill. And you know what it is? When I was seeing a vision of this fight, I was seeing Alex Pereira... And all of his weaknesses. And then I was just translating it with Jamal Hill, KO and Johnny Walker. And KO and Jimmy Crew. And I was looking back at Alex Pereira's fights and I was like, damn, he's open to shots sometimes, man. Sometimes this guy's open to shots. Damn, there are moments in a fight where he's open to shots. And then boom. I would think of like four minute long sequences of Alex Pereira's fight. And I would find pros and cons and openings and weaknesses and, and strengths and advantages. And then I would just go, when Johnny Walker got KO'd by Jamal Hill and Looney Tunes character fell his way backwards into the cage. And that's all I would think about. And I was like, damn, I could see Pereira getting, get, getting KO'd like that. I could really see that. But then I looked at Jamal Hill's fights, man. And I'm going to be honest with Jamal Hill. I'm just going to keep it real. I keep it 100, dude. I keep it 100. There's an idea of Jamal Hill. And it's a great idea. There's a vision of him. There's a... There's a promise. There's a hope. Jamal Hill. Nasty hands. Sweet dreams. You watch him KO Jimmy Crute. Damn, that was slick. You watch him KO Johnny Walker. Damn, that was slick. KO and Jimmy, Jimmy Crute and Johnny Walker. That's just part of being a man. Jimmy Crute fights on the feet like he's stepping on Legos. We found that out. Johnny Walker can't take a clean punch. Pereira can. 
He can take clean shots. I watched him take clean shots. Is it good that I watched him take clean shots? No, but I've also watched Jamal Hill take clean shots. I'm going to be honest with you there. Jamal Hill's a southpaw. It's going to take away the one-two. It's not going to be as much of a factor. I think Pereira can adjust. Sometimes Jamal Hill does fight, fight orthodox, though. He was fighting orthodox against Glover to share quite a bit. Maybe that's where he trusts his takedown defense a little bit more. We're going to have to wonder that. But there's often times where you see Jamal Hill in Southpaw and he'll crack someone with his lead hook and Johnny Walker goes sinking backwards. Like He can be orthodox, actually. Now I'm thinking about it. He's not purely Southpaw. So the one tube is going to be there, but the low kick is also going to be there for Alex Pereira. And I'm just going to say how it is, Jamal Hill. This is my ultimate deciding factor of this. I've watched your fights. Sometimes when you throw that straight left, your right hand's right by your waist. Like, you, like sometimes defensively, your hands are lower than the two fists on your chest. Okay? You'd think with those two fists on your chest, they'd be like a constant reminder to at least keep them at that level or above. But I'm watching Jamal Hill's fights. And I'm seeing openings for that left hook on the backup for Alex Pereira. I'm seeing it. And I think this is a fight where, you know, when Yuri comes forward, you have to backpedal. And that meant Alex Pereira couldn't really find his counter shots as well. So he had to heavily rely on the low kicks. Because Yuri's like a tumbling force coming forward where he could just get flatlined. But you have to go backwards. You can't just stay there in front of him. You might get head ca headbutt KO'd against him. Jamal Hill encroaches forward properly and when you do that you allow Alex Pereira to not have to stumble backwards and get space you allow him to plant and throw to take a one step back and throw to take a shift back and throw and that's where he's going to be able to find that left hook I see Jamal Hill's right hand by his waist quite a bit and I'll be honest with you guys I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it real as I've said 50 times this prediction because I'm worried about Jamal Hill roasting the fuck out of me if he does have an interview uh <laughs> I'm going to keep it real. If Jamal Hill had momentum, and this was him three months after the Glover Teixeira fight, and Alex Pereira was trying to move up and fight Jamal Hill, I probably would pick Jamal Hill. An Achilles rupture is one of the most devastating injuries you can have. And you're fighting a guy who has some of the nastiest non-telegraphed low kicks, potentially in the history of the sport, at the higher weight classes at least. Very nasty, very sharp, very painful looking, very fast, non-telegraphed low kicks on an Achilles injury. And I'm telling you this right now, I don't think you... Have, maybe this will be something I find out upon speaking to Jamal Hill, maybe. I don't know if he's going to do it, but we'll see. I'm worried that this isn't the ideal comeback date for Jamal Hill. I'm worried that the UFC was scrambling for a main event and they made Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill, which didn't seem like their first option. I'm not saying it's a bad main event. I now, now it's coming up. I'm like, what a main event. This is great. This is an amazing main event. Dangerous main event. But Alex, but Jamal Hill. So much time off. Not crazy amount of time off, but he's been out for like, oh, what, a year and four months now since he fought Glover. And I'm looking at some of the guys he couldn't KO. He couldn't put away Glover. The Thiago Santos fight was a TKO. But it was more Santos just sort of giving in to the pressure of Hill. Like Santos gave him all he could. And then Hill was still there in his face. And you saw Santos start to mentally break. And maybe Pereira will as well. But I think if you're going to pick Jamal Hill, you should be picking him by KO with a, with a snap. With a boom and down goes Pereira. That's where he's going to win this fight, I think. And I can't... I don't think I'm willing to bet all my eggs on that. I'm not willing to bet all my, all my eggs that he puts out Pereira, but I could see Pereira putting him out because I was watching Santos catch him with left hooks. Aye, aye, aye. I'm going with Alex Pereira. I could see him hurting Hill to the body with a left hook and then maybe bringing it upstairs at a later time now that Jamal Hill's right hand's going to be a bit more tucked after that body shot or something. Maybe a body kick from Pereira lands and, you know, Hill tries to catch it and we start seeing that right hand drop a bit more. And I think we're going to see Alex Pereira move out the way of that straight right of Jamal Hill if he throws it. Fade it, left hook over the top, and it might be a similar KO 
to when he KO'd that guy on the regional scene in LFA before he got to the UFC. That type of style. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Those are my thoughts on the card. Those are my predictions. We'll see if the beanie grants me success of 100% prediction rate. To be honest with you guys, I have no idea who's going to win any of these fights. <laughs> All of them are a gamble. Some of them are known. Some of them are known. Don't get me wrong. Some of them are known. But I've learned over time in MMA, there's just no point bringing logic to the game. So I'm just going off my instincts, man. I'm going off my feelings. I reckon Pereira's going to annoy that leg of Hill. I think he's going to find that left hook. Hill could find the two. But I think Pereira knows he's going to be looking for that two. And that's going to set up a trap. And again, you, Hill's going to say... I know he's looking for the left hook, so I'm going to set a trap. But I feel like Hill's style is better suited to, like, a straight puncher at him. You know what I mean? Like, he, he's good at, like, you see Hill, he scouts with his head. I'm going to add a bit more into this prediction. He scouts with his head quite a bit, with his hand down sometimes. And he's, like, he's like probing with his head sometimes. And then you throw and he goes, pull counter. You know what I mean? He does that quite a bit where he's leading with his head. He's stepping in. He might throw a high kick off the right leg or whenever he's orthodox, this is. He scopes with his head. He scouts punches, I like to call it. I've heard others call it that as well. Like, I'm not saying I came up with that. Um, but he scouts punches with his head. He'll like put it in range, like knowing that he's got room to back up. He's given himself room to pull counter. I think that works better against someone looking to jab against him or someone looking to throw a straight punch against him and then he can pull and, and crack him as they're a bit out of off balance. I feel like Pereira is going to wait for Hill to go first. And if Hill goes first... Hey, up, hey, hey, up, hey, hey, up, hey, hey, up, hey. And if Alex Pereira loses, it's all Pollyanna's, uh, Pollyanna Viana fault. Uh, that succubus. And we will be blaming her. See you later. Goodbye. Toodle Pip. Thank you for watching. Holloway gone beat that ass. And I want everyone to come back to this video when he does. Because I've seen this shit for a while now. I've been saying this for a while. You can go back in the channel and look at my video about Holloway going to give Gaethje a bit more trouble than people think. I've been thinking this for a long time. I think Holloway is going to look good and I think he's going to win. Jerome Holloway is going to win. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Uh, damn. Really good fight card, man. Let me just talk about the fight card in general here. What a card. Am I annoyed at how stacked it is a little bit? Yeah, but I, I, I like hating on things because hate is an emotion that I can, I can only feel hate, I feel like. It's one of the only emotions I have. So I like expressing it. Um, I'm getting it out of my system. I have a lot of it to give. But I'm looking at UFC 300 and I'm thinking to myself, man. What a card, but how dare you leave us with Nicolau Perez the weekend after. I'm fine. Anyone else finding themselves thinking that a little bit more? Like, come on, UFC. You couldn't have spared us Bobby Green, Jim Miller on the recent fight card. If they would have done Allen versus Curtis 2 in the main event and in a co-main event of Bobby Green, Jim Miller, that fight card is infinitely like twice as good for the cost of one fight. And you could have just put Hernandez versus Jackson on the prelims of UFC 300. It's an amazing card, but I'm hoping in the future, once this UFC 300, UFC 299 era is over, I'm hoping we can, what's the word I'm looking for here? Ration fights a little bit better. Where the main card of the pay-per-view is amazing and stacked with top contenders and former champions and amazing fights. But then the, pre the early prelims are where you put Trevor Peak, Charlie Campbell. Because it's going to be a fun fight. It's going to blow the roof off the place. But you don't need to pay them that much. And they're not ranked. You know what I mean? So you can save, like, you know, we've got a UFC fight night with the main event of Lewis versus Nascimento. You put something from the prelims on that card instead, like Figueredo Garbrandt as a main event, instead of having, having it open up the early prelims. It's infinitely an amazing fight night card. And I hope we go back to that a little bit where, don't get me wrong, I love that the main card is stacked. I love that the prelims are stacked. The early prelims, you can have some up-and-comers on there. You can have your Peyton Tabbert on there. You can have your Trevor Peak, Charlie Campbell on there, to use the example again. But you can, like, ration out Turner Moicano and Bobby Green, Jim Miller and Figueredo Garbrandt to some other fight nights surrounding it so we get 
more consistent levels of quality rather than just all of the quality at once. And then it's like a fucking try not to snooze challenge as we try and sit through Nicolau versus Perez for five rounds because Alex Perez just had one of the most boring fights ever against Makayev. And he's been rewarded off of a loss with a main event now. I know it's a short notice replacement, but are we not past that? Like, you shouldn't be losing boring fights and then getting given main events. Come on. We got to fix it, UFC. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Toodle Pip. I'll see you later. Goodbye.